Welcome back to setting up Azure resources. I'm Richard Knuckles, your host. Today's episode is going to be about creating your first job in an Azure data lake analytics service. In the last episode, we created the data lake analytics service and went through some of the features on the overview blade and the limits and policy blade. Today, we're going to be looking at setting up a new job. We've got two places to go for doing that. Here on the left nav in Data Lake Analytics, you've got a new job blade or the job management blade. Let's go straight into new job. So we'll see later what the job management window looks like. We're setting up a new job here with USQL. You get three places to enter data here in this blade. First off is a name for your job. Just call this first job. Second is the number of AUs to use for this. In a previous video, we discussed maximum AUs for the service. For now, we're going to leave this at one because all jobs will run at their most efficient with only a single AU, but they won't run as fast potentially as they could. The last option you have here is the actual window for putting in USQL. One of the most daunting parts of starting with Data Lake Analytics is this blade itself because you are absolutely free to put in whatever you want in this box with no guidance. So that's what I'm here to provide you today, a framework for creating a new USQL batch job. So the four things that you'll want in your batch job will be a variable to select the files that you want to import, an import command using an extractor function, a aggregation, transformation, or other type of query that actually does the work of your batch job and a output command using an outputter function. Let's take a look at each of these four elements in detail. I've created a sample script which covers each of these. Let's start with a list of files. So this is a variable called in. You can see that it's defined with the at sign is the variable notation. It's a string variable and we're setting it to a text value. All rows in the USQL language end with a semicolon. The last part of this is declare which starts the command for adding a new variable expression in USQL. For now you can say this is a variable called in with a path of staging demo and then a wildcard here with a for a file of sensor.csv. So I previously set this particular file in this folder in the data lake store that's connect to this data lake analytics service. So we have the path that leads to that folder and we have this file name with this wildcard. Using a wildcard, the extractor command function will read the rest of this text to find the path to this file. And then any text in the name of the file will be replaced with this wildcard. So files of sensor underscore one, sensor underscore two, sensor underscore three dot CSV will all be read using this path. So this is the extractor statement. We've got multiple parts to this, an expression, which is a variable that will hold the data that comes from this extractor. The extract command, which starts off the SQL statement, a from command telling which data path to read the data files from, and then a using command which describes what extractor to use for this extract statement. 
this case, we're using the CSV extractor, which comes built into every data lake analytics service uSQL implementation. You have a standard text extractor, a tab separated values extractor, and a comma separated values extractor. For this particular file in this folder, we're using a comma separated value setup. And you can see it has a header row with these particular column names and each of the data rows is comma separated. If you look closely at these, you can see we have a GUID format here in the first column, a text format in the second column, integer format in the third column, a decimal format in the fourth column, and three date form, date fields for the rest of the columns. You can see I've replicated those field declarations here in the extract statement for the extractor, starting with a GUID for the ID and a string for the player, and matching the rest of the column data types as we define the columns. It's very important that you match the number of columns in your extract statement with the number of columns in your file and that you match the data types of the fields in your extract statement with the data that you have in your data source. One of the features of uSQL is the combination of C-sharp data types into the SQL structure of this language. During the extraction process, when we read the file that we've defined here in the at in variable, and using right here in the from command or from parameter. These rows and these fields will be converted with the C sharp conversion for these data types. So as long as we're pretty close, we will convert complex strings and values into strongly typed C sharp fields. The last thing we're passing a parameter here with the skip first row in rows parameter set to one. If we look at our data file here, we can see we have a header row and the skip first in rows allows us to skip one or more rows, including a row that might be a header. We don't read the header row to determine what our field names will be in the player's variable. We instead specify our field names here in the extract statement. Now that we've hopefully got our data read in to the player's variable, we can do a calculation with it. As you can see, we're defining an, another variable that will hold the output of this select statement. This is another uSQL SQL statement that takes the player's variable, which is holding this row set of data that we read from this list of text files, and then performing this calculation on it. Select these fields from this set of fields. As you can see, we have a calculation here using the average. We have a conversion. Event time, you can see, was specified as a date time field here. So we can use the C-sharp toString command to output a string and provide a formatting value in, to the toString command to get us a formatted date time string. So we're selecting these two fields straight from the player's variable row set. But then as soon as we create a variation on one of those fields, we actually need to create a new name for the new field. So we use the as keyword and provide a file name or a field name for the new field. And I see here that we don't actually have a field called value in the player's row set. We have instead one called node value. So that error will cause the entire job to fail when it calculates 
and prepares to run. We'll leave this in and you can see what an error looks like in the compiling of this useql job. Since we're using an average function in this select statement, we need to have a group by command as well. So we use the group by keywords in order to group by the fields that we're not aggregating on. So that was our third piece. We've collected a list of files to read. We've read the files in. We've done a calculation with the data that we've read in. Now we need to output our data to a file. The USQL language and the data lake analytics jobs read files and write files and process data in between. For most of your batch processing, you're going to be reading data files in and generating new data files with the data that you've read. Almost all of your USQL jobs will end with an outputter command. We're using another variable called out to define the path to the output file that we're going to be writing. In this case, we're using the curated folder and another CSV file format. In order to write the files out, we use the output function, output command. So we output the row set variable that we defined here with this select. So we output that row set to the path that we've defined here in the out variable using an outputter. In this case, we're using the CSV. We're going to output the daily ag row set variable to the file path we've defined with our out variable using the outputters class CSV function. The CSV function takes several different parameters. In this case, we're going to be outputting a header along with this. So we set the output header parameter to true. And this will output the fields that are in the daily ag row set, which include player, node, average date, and average. Take note that value here does not match one of these, so we should get an error when we try to submit this. So let's go ahead and submit this job. And we'll see what happens when the USQL is compiled and prepared for submission to the cluster for running. Here in the top left, you can see there is a countdown. This screen automatically refreshes every 30 seconds to give you an update on how the job is running. So we can see this job has failed to compile. We have an error message. The name value does not exist in the current context. And you can see even here in the details, we actually get a helpful hint as to where the error occurs in our USQL code. So we could either start a brand new job at this point, or we can use the handy shortcut of reuse script to create a new job with the old script, the old name, and the old number of AUs. In this case, let's change this value, the field name, to node value to match node value here. And we'll submit that once more. You can see we're in the preparing stage, which compiles the USQL into intermediate language code using the .NET CLR, and we'll submit it to the cluster for execution if it compiles. As you can see on the left, there are several bits of data that are being collected about this job as it's running. We have the total amount of progress, progress meter here, the number of AUs that are running, the number of AU hours that have been used already, and the cost so far for this job. And you can see this job has completed now. It took 44 seconds to prepare, which we weren't charged for. It took 32 seconds to run, and it's now complete. It cost us two cents. Here in the right-hand column, we have several more pieces of information. The script that was used for this job, a list of inputs, input files that were read in based on our wildcard definition, and a list of files that were read, written out. You can actually click these and go to a file viewer if you have 
a text-based file that can be read here in the browser. You can take a look at the AU analysis, which will show how many AUs were used, and you can compare an estimated plan for using multiple AUs. And if there were errors in the batch running, you can review any of those errors and try to improve performance next time. All right, one of the nice things you can do is scroll back through your history of jobs and windows to see how far you've come along. And then you can get back to the job management blade. In the job management blade, you can see our two job runs, same name, one failed, one succeeded, and how long they ran. That's it for today. In the next video, we'll take a look at the job management screen and go back and review more details about our previously run jobs. Thanks for watching. That's it for now. Click subscribe to see more videos like this. If you liked this video, hit the like button. Leave a comment in the section below to let me know what videos you'd like to see in the future.